Welcome to Neurosalience, the OHBM podcast. Welcome to the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Neurosalience podcast. I'm Peter Banatini, and here I discuss brain imaging and modeling with scientists from around the world. Today, I'm excited to have Dr. Evan Gordon. Evan's an assistant professor in the Neuroimaging Labs Research Center based in the Mallinckrodt Institute of Radiology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Since joining the WashU group and joining forces with what is known as the Midnight Scan Club, he has gone on a scientific tear, publishing several highly influential papers that make use of the unique high fidelity data sets containing up to 11 hours of resting state or task activated fMRI data for each subject. This powerful approach in fMRI is known as deep sampling. His findings include insights into unique individual connectivity patterns, the whole brain use of a novel parcellation approach using boundary maps, and most recently, the discovery of effector-specific regions within the motor cortex, a finding which is likely to replace in textbooks the classic Penfield maps of the homunculus. So I spent a day or so preparing for each of these podcasts. In doing so, I delve more deeply into a specific topic or the work of the person than I typically would. In researching Evan's work and the work of the Midnight Sand Club, I was more than just impressed. It kind of just hit me that they really nailed it. Deep sampling of individuals opens up new avenues of exploration and adds power to fMRI to ask questions not typically possible. I'm convinced that perhaps the most promising future of fMRI, where the most discoveries and even the most useful clinical applications will be made, resides in collection of extremely high fidelity individual subject fMRI data. This was a wonderful conversation where we explored the implementation, benefits, and potential of deep sampling of fMRI data. Evan is not only a creative and productive scientist, but a great conversationalist. I hope you enjoy it. And Evan, welcome. Thank you so much for having me on, Peter. I really appreciate it. This is exciting. Yeah, it's. Uh, I had a lot of fun. I was... I, uh, was just mentioning to you before. It's like I had so much fun preparing for this. I mean, usually there's a, a little bit of work preparing for this, but um, just reading your papers, it's been exciting to see your career kind of like, you know, I've known you since, uh, you know, I was on your committee for uh, uh, in graduate school um, at Georgetown, but um, but then you went off to, to Wash U and then you were doing well, but then it just took off. And I think that, you know, you had so many high impact papers and it's been really exciting to read about them. And and I think that preparing for this podcast, you know, taking a deep dive like this, I really gained an appreciation for the idea of doing deep sampling of, of subjects. So we'll get into all that soon. But so just to just to start, I usually like to start with a little bit of history. You know, I try to go back various amounts, but um, uh, and people like to hear about how you came to be in this position when you first had your interest peaked in neuroscience. Uh, I believe you, your undergraduate was at, at Duke University. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and that's that's definitely what got me super interested in neuroscience and neuroimaging. I remember I was really interested in the mind and in the brain. And uh, Duke at the time did not have a, a cognitive neuroscience major. They had sort of you know hardcore animal neuroscience, but they and they had cognitive psychology, but they didn't have anything sort of bridging the gap because cognitive neuroscience was newish at the time. I, I still, it wasn't that new. They should have had something and later they did. But at that time, um, it was, it was, so I, I was in sort of cognitive neuroscience. That was my major. And, um, I was excited about it for a while, but I got so frustrated with every class I would take in undergraduate showing me sort of boxes and arrows. The mind is made of boxes and arrows. Um, <laughs> and, and I just, I, I was like, this, this can't be all there is. There has to be something. What, what, what does this box mean in sort of in, in, in reality, in, in sort of biological terms? And I took a class taught by Kevin Pelfrey, who he was pretty early in his career then. And I later talked to him and that was apparently the first class he ever taught. I loved it so much. He did a great job. He did a great job getting the class excited about 
using neuroimaging to understand, you know, what these boxes and arrows actually meant in the real world, not just in the world of like, oh, we're cognitive psychologists who thought up things, but there's actual representations of the brain of, of these things. And so I came, you know, like halfway through the class, I was so excited about the stuff we were doing. I came up to Kevin and I was like, can I please work in your lab? At the time, I don't think he had money to hire people, but he pointed me towards Scott Hutel. And I worked for Scott then for another year and a half, the last year and a half of my undergrad, and then another year after I graduated. And that's how I got my start in neuroimaging. And I loved doing the work so much. It was like nothing I had done before. It was... I still feel like it's magic. I still feel like it's magic that we have a machine that uses magnets to look inside your brain. It's, you know, like we get so used to just doing it. I Sometimes I just like to step back and say like, this is sorcery. This is just incredible that we can do this. And so I I just loved working with, working at Duke, working with with Scott. And so that's that's how I got enthusiastic about it. And I really, every part of it, I, I, I realized this more and more about myself, the parts I was most excited about was the mapping parts. It was cool to do, you know, uh, Scott at the time was, he was, and he still is very interested in neuroeconomic stuff. And so it was cool to develop these gambling tasks and look at how people's perception of gains and losses would change depending on context and all of those things. But what I really loved was mapping the brain, mapping these constructs into the brain, understanding what parts of the brain did what. And I think anybody who has this sort of deep love for fMRI especially appreciates that, that the power of of that kind of work of the power of of saying like now I understand something about this particular part of the brain yeah yeah and I, and I feel the same way I mean I think I you know I can still stare at a time series and just be like oh this is just so beautiful that you just get this activation and and it's and I think that right I mean I think that people, a lot of people, right, who are in this, like share this sort of, you know, it's not just an intellectual thing, like, oh, we're just, you know, doing something, a thing or something out. It's sort of like this weird, not weird, but like sort of this passion um, that, yeah, that's cool that that it was there from the start and and you, you sort of discover it in yourself. So then you went to Georgetown, you got your PhD working with Chandan Vaidya. Yeah, Chandan was a wonderful mentor to me. Yeah, I, I loved my time at Georgetown. It was great. She She gave me so much flexibility to pursue the ideas and that I wanted to pursue. She was in the psychology department, and so she was very oriented towards the more cognitive psychology, like let's understand uh, components of attention and working memory. And I liked that stuff, but again, like I was all about the mapping. Let's make brain maps. Let's let's understand how these things are reified in the brain. And she really gave me free reign to to do that kind of work and she was she was so great Shonda was so great i always say this about Shonda. you know she was the kind of person who you would go into a meeting with her and what she would be telling you in the meeting is this idea is stupid and it'll never work and you should do something else and you come out of a meeting like that with her think feeling so good about yourself because she just had this ability to make you feel so good about yourself and to to build you up and validate you, even when she was course correcting you. And it, it's this amazing skill that I, I wish I could be a, a fifth as good as a, as supportive a mentor as she was. Right. Uh, without too much of a problem, you got your PhD and, and finished up and, and, and you, you were doing mapping, you were doing working memory and working in some genetics work, but then you, then obviously then you came to wash you as a postdoc. And I, I wasn't sure whether, it was with either Steve Peterson or Tim Lauman or... or uh, <laughs> it's, it's really funny, Peter. You know, the, Tim Lauman was a grad student in oh, the lab at the time. I didn't know. I don't know. <laughs> you well, know, I, 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 I tell Tim this sometimes that he... He's a he's a person who it's very hard to understand his career what his career stage actually is because <laughs> while he was a grad student he was doing this incredible work and then of course he was MD PhD so he sort of just like you know disappeared off the face of the earth for a while while he was getting his his MD portion so okay. yeah it's it's very confusing no I was working with I was working with Steve okay um, okay <laughs> and Tim was also working with Steve. Steve's lab at that time was just incredible. I think I was I was so lucky to come into Steve's lab at the time I did. He had this incredible 
concentration of of young, excited, brilliant students. Um, I would not put myself at the top of that collection at all, but I think there was this this amazing synergy that he sort of guided us all. And it's like that concentration of sort of, of of brilliance was like I've never been in an environment like that. And it was it was it was not only how many smart people were around, but it was there was no, you know, a lot of times you get in these environments where like everybody's really good and it's kind of like a competition. Yeah. There's none of that. It was unbelievably collaborative and and how Steve managed to sort of wrangle all of us is pointing in the same direction, each sort of in our lane, but supporting each other's lanes. It was, you know, one of the most amazing environments I've ever been in. Yeah. And, and, and actually, right. I mean, I'm just thinking of all the groups and there's only maybe a, a small handful of groups even comparable in this regard, especially in the context of doing this sort of fMRI. And I realize, you know, I overlap with Randy Buckner as a postdoc at MGH and, and I realize his first, you know, and there might have been this idea even then, but he was sort of like starting the whole idea of, of deep imaging, uh, of deep sampling. Uh, you know, he, he wanted to do like, oh, let's compare 10 subjects, each subject scan 10 times and, and see how this, you know, how we begin to compare these maps. I mean, he sort of went in slightly different directions, but still. Yeah. A um, lot of people were, were sort of revolving around this idea, certainly. Randy's stuff was coming out sort of at very similar time that, uh, that our earlier stuff was coming out and had a very similar thrust. And I would say I'm, I, you know, sometimes it, that can be terrifying because you're afraid you get scooped, but we were just mostly really happy about that because it meant that, you know, somebody else was very prominent in the field who, you know, Randy has, if Randy's onto something, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it means something. And, and Randy yeah. believed in this stuff and it really gave us confidence that we were, we should believe in this too. The idea was there before that, of course, you know, like I go back to like Nancy Canwisher's stuff. She, I think, really start was the first one pointing to we need to do brain mapping on an individual basis, right? Yeah. But it was so restricted because she she was focusing in so tightly on these visually responsive areas that I don't think that people who you know cared more about like lateral prefrontal cortex working memory or something like that got the idea that like these, these things that, that Nancy was doing really, this applies to you too. I don't think it, it translated as well as uh, it could have. And there was the pull. I mean, obviously there's the, the limits of scan time and how long a person can tolerate a scanner. It's like, you know, it's like an hour or so. And then, and then you figure, okay, you're done. And, and there's also the, the previous culture of PET imaging, which required a lot of averaging. Yeah. And also, you know, because it used, ionizing radiation, you need different subjects. And so somehow that culture, you know, kind of came into fMRI and. Well, I thought, I thought it was that, but I thought it also, I mean, I, I was maybe sort of young to see this and maybe it's, it's my perspective isn't right, but I thought that a lot of it was because fMRI was so prominent emerging from cognitive psychology, it's cognitive psychology turning into cognitive neuroimaging, right? that in the cognitive psychology perspective properly like there's there's nothing there's not nearly as much to be gained from cognitive psychology of like repeating the same task over and over again there the idea is really to look for sort of common effects across a larger group yeah. for the most part and i thought that that was the perspective that really drove a lot of early cognitive neuroimaging towards this well let's let's get 30 people and see what's common across the 30 people if fmri had emerged from a, a medical discipline like neurology, it would have had a very different track. Like it would have from the start been focused on what can we say about individual patients? Yes, that's interesting, right. <laughs> um, well, I mean, either way, it seems like it's evolving hopefully in the right direction uh, now. And so uh, before we get into, you know, precision, I mean, I, I, I really liked your, I mean, a number, all of your papers, but, um, you know, this is a, sort of the one that sort of introduced it to me, at least, was this uh, one in Neuron in 2017, uh, Precision Functional Mapping of Individual Human Brains. And you, you said you collected six hours of resting and five hours of, of task-related fMRI, and then you had other T1, T2, angiography, and, and whatnot, and a lot of behavioral assessments as well. I mean, what, do you th what would you say to somebody who's like, well, instead of collecting 10 hours uh, with one subject, why can't I collect one hour with 10 subjects? 
And uh, what would you, what answer would you, would you give to them? I mean, well, that's... yeah. So I, I get this question all the time. <laughs> Anytime I present this data, the the number one question I'm asked is, so how much time should I be collecting? Right. And I, I've come, I, I can't say that it's like, that's a wrong way, a wrong question. Uh, you know, if you would have had, if you would have asked me that 10 years ago, I, you know, from the same, I might've sort of had the same sort of question, like, okay, how much should I collect? But I have come around to the idea that that is maybe not the best way to think about it, right? So, okay, if the question is, how much data should you collect? Obviously, the of course, you know what the answer is going to be. It depends on what you're looking at, right? There's no one size fits all answer to the question of how much data should you collect. But I will say this. I've started thinking about this I, with an analogy of, of, a, of a microscope. Like, let's say that we have discovered that we can make microscopes for the first time, right? And I look at the, my microscope and I see this cool thing that's like this little piece of an organism that looks like it's really discrete. And I call this thing a cell, right? Now, making the microscope lenses is really hard. It costs money. And you come to me and you say, <clears throat> okay, I, I like this cell idea. What's the cheapest microscope? What's the cheapest microscope lens I can make where I still get to see cells, right? <laughs> and I would say, okay, there's there's probably an answer to that. But maybe a better way to think of it is, can we make the microscope lenses even better so we could see what's inside the cells? I've started like like doing this thing where the microscope lenses are, yeah, they're really expensive, but I think I can see stuff inside the cells. I'm calling them organelles and like, there's really important stuff in there. Yeah. And, but like people come to me and they, they say like, I, all I'm interested in is cells. I want to, because I want to see the cells and count how many cells and I'll do stats on the cells. And that's my research project doing the stats. And I think that there's, I think it's, it's, it's a way to do science, but there's another way to do science, which is if we want to discover things about the brain that we haven't seen before, we are not trying to sort of maximize a you know, power relative to scan cost. We just need to get the highest quality data we possibly can. And we'll keep finding new things. Uh, we have data, it's much better than what we had in the Midnight Scan Club. It's better even than what we we published in our more recent papers because these new multi-echo sequences are really nice. Oh. Um, and we're seeing stuff in this new data that we hadn't seen before because the data is nicer and because we're collecting a really large amount. And so to anyone listening who wants to ask the question, how much data, what, what's the smallest amount of data I should collect to, 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 for my project? I would say collect more than you think, because there's always more interesting things in my experience, always, always more interesting things to find if you get more data. There's this, there's this amazing alchemy that happens when you start looking at uh, fMRI images. We've all looked at fMRI images and, you know, you, you can look at an fMRI image and, and you have a sense looking at it like, oh, that, that one's a little noisy, that, that's, that one's something janky happened with that one. I don't, I don't totally believe it. When you look at an fMRI image that is unbelievably high quality, where you've collected a ton of data, it's, it's multi-echo, you've denoised it like amazingly, it's, ama it's unbelievably high quality. There's this alchemy that happens where you, you see weird stuff in the image and you stop saying something is wrong with that. There's noise. It's a little janky because there's not noise in this yeah. image anymore. You've squeezed out almost all the noise. You don't really have to smooth very much anymore. And you're, you're seeing these, these amazingly interestingly detailed features of, of brain networks, of functional neuroanatomy that you've never seen before, that no one's ever seen before. And they mean something and you split your data in half and you have enough of it that, that it's the, the two halves are the exact same. You see the exact same thing in the same subject in two halves. You look at another subject who's also beautiful and you see, oh, that subject also has something that looks like that. It's, it's small. I never would have seen this before if I didn't have this kind of data, but it's there. Yeah. It changes the way you think about neuroimaging. It really does. And you stop saying, you stop saying, well, I need to collect, you know, X number of subjects and average them together. And you start saying, what can I discover in this brain image that I could never see before? Because I just, it's not even because it wasn't there. It was, it's 
it might have been there, but I didn't believe it. My data wasn't good enough for me to believe it. And now I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think just to emphasize that point, I totally agree with you. And I think that, and it's actually interesting. So, you know, people, you know, right, they do activation, they see a signal change and they map it. And, and I think that, yeah, keeping with one subject, looking at one subject and averaging that like crazy, and then, and then looking at that data, actually the, the amount of, like you say, the amount of detail that you know is not artifact starts popping out and it becomes like real information. And you lose that if you, you know, average across subjects. And, and it's not only the spatial information, it's the temporal information as well. There's features in the time series that are interesting. Um, but, then, but then the question is, right, I mean, then, then still the question is, okay, this information versus signal to noise sort of curve or whatever, you know, at some point you imagine it might plateau. Yes, and, yes. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, that, and you had one paper which you, sort of have a, a number of curves that sort yes. of, and, and it seems that like it plateaus around a hundred minutes or so. Well, uh, but I, I actually started to disagree with that, right? Okay. So here's what happens. I agree, it, it plateaus. And in in our 2017 paper, we showed that, yeah, it, it's plateaued at a hundred minutes or, or maybe even like 60 minutes. You don't need to collect much more than an hour, right? Yeah. That was for, that was for parcels, right? Here's yes. what happens. Once you get that plateau, you can, you can you can start looking for finer scale things. So that was at the level of parcels, right? If you're at the level of pla if you're plateauing at the level of parcels, it's time to start looking at at voxels or, yeah. or surface vertices. Yeah, it's time to start looking at your data at a finer scale resolution. If you started plateauing at surface or in surface vertices, it's time to to smooth your data less. Yeah, like there's there's we ha our data. I have I have data I've collected that's it's this multi-echo stuff and I have like 10 hours on a subject wow. and there's still, I, I feel like if I could, if the data was better, if the data was higher resolution, yeah. um, I could see more, especially in, in, for instance, like subcortical regions, right? Where the SNR is lower. We need, you need more data to plateau. Uh, everything is finer. You need high resolution. If you've got high resolution, then your SNR is lower. You need more data to compensate. We're not there yet. At, at maximizing the amount of information we can get. There is more to do. I, I started to suspect that maybe we could, we could map out the connectivity of cranial nerves in the brainstem. Huh. If, you get, if we get high enough resolution data, I think we can, we can start figuring out, like this is what, because I've seen stuff in the brainstem where it's like, okay, I know that the trigeminal nerve is around here and I see like it looks like this, these couple voxels are really strongly connected to the, the somatomotor face area. This wow. is really plausible. Yeah. I think there's, there's anatomy we can get to much below the scale of, of, you know, a, a, a parcel that, that does, you know, max out its reliability at, at an hour. Yeah. And there's so much, right. There's so much that I want to respond to in, in terms of what you said. I mean, the whole concept of parcels sort of, makes me uneasy um uh and and you know especially taking a standard parcel template but also i totally agree with you actually as a matter of fact you know, i've been sort of hinting this with my group for quite some time for about a couple of years now but now i'm like after preparing for this podcast i'm like came back to him like we have to collect you know 0.8 millimeter resolution <laughs> data and just average the heck out of individual subjects and see what we see, you know, maybe layers, maybe, you know, you could, if you could actually make an individualized whole brain layer. Uh, oh, sorry. your layer stuff is so cool. I, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a way that you can use the high data stuff. Oh my God. You could, I think you could get so much cool information out of the layer stuff. Yeah. It's so it, right. And it's hard. It's really hard to go to that resolution for a number of reasons. And plus you're, you know, your temporal signal noise is, you know, get above 20 to one. But if you do enough averaging on an individual subject, you can, you can start to get there. Well, um, I will tell you though, like towards that, I, some of the, some of, I, I keep talking about the multi-echo stuff because I'm really excited about it. I've, I've, I've seen in our sort of uh, uh, single echo data that like in, in the brainstem, our signal to noise was around like eight, right? And yeah. when we did use the multi-echo and we use some of the more advanced denoising techniques that are coming out, it's, it's closer to 35, 40. Wow. Like where you can like start believing some of the stuff you see. Now, brainstem has weird artifacts in it. There's, um, there's, there's 
interesting like like csf flow artifacts that because it's actually the csf is flowing uh through the yep. through the fourth ventricle and it's actually pushing the brain stem around but yeah. if you can deal with those artifacts that cause these sort of banding issues your csf your snr is surprisingly high with these new sequences so i'm really enthusiastic about our ability to do this even even at very high uh, uh fine spatial resolutions well, that's yeah, and and multi echo is becoming you know hopefully the the clinical scanners are you know getting better sequences you know it's the only way to disseminate these sequences is having you know Siemens have a whip or something like that that yeah. does it which, which isn't totally optimal but it, it's you know it's good uh, yeah I think that I totally agree with you there of course uh, multi echo and trying to do you know layer maybe with maybe some sort of a you know blood volume sensitive technique or even bold um, with multi echo is just yeah, that would be very, that'd be a fun data set to work with. Yeah. Um, and right, and I totally, and I completely agree with you that the spatial, uh, as you increase your spatial scale, the, yeah, the the amount of information that pops out. And, and we did this, we did this once with, you know, Javier Gonzalez Castillo had like, a, you know, 10 hours of averaging or nine hours of averaging with a uh, single subject. And he had a very different tack, but it was sort of also interesting that, you know, he had a very simple task and, and uh, decided, well, we're not going to use a canonical reference function. We're just going to see whatever is time locked. And mm -hmm. you see a lot of time lock signal that you would otherwise think is noise that's time locked and it's organized and it's everywhere in the brain. So it's so that opens up sort of that sort of avenue as well. But there's all kinds of things that you've shown that many, many avenues open up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So maybe let's talk a little bit about parcellation. And maybe we can loop back to precision mapping, but I, it's, it's, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the multi-echo because that's sort of like free signal to noise. To, you know, there's a little bit of a cost, but, um, and there's more you can do with that. For instance, with the CSF, you could, uh, you know, you could project back to the intercept and, you know, separate out the, the bold effect from the CSF effect, right. you know, things like that. Um, so, okay. So, uh, um, with parceling, so so parcellation actually is is I mean you you came up with a, a really nice method uh, for for parcelating individual brains, which I think uh, is nice in, if you do it on an individual basis um, or even for making templates. I don't know it, um, as far as the uh, uh, the boundary map parcellation. And yeah, well, I, I don't want to <clears throat> take credit for for coming up with this, right? You know, this this work started in Steve's lab back yeah. with Alex, Alex Cohen's publication in two thousand eight. Right. And then oh. Goggenwig advanced this with with uh, Tim Lauman, and then I was just sort of like the the, the, the uh, riding on their coattails and coming along and doing sort of the the last bit of work to to push it into um, uh, all, this whole brain thing because I'm I'm even forgetting people like Steve Nelson yeah. did this great uh, boundary ba uh, based parcellation in like insula cortex and in lateral parietal cortex, but yeah, we just we. I think pushing it like that last step into the whole brain, which is what people really wanted, this sort of whole brain parcellation, um, it, it that got people really excited. Yeah. And I think that the reason that I like this parcellation approach is like Steve really drilled this into me um, and I, I I came to totally buy it. The, the boundary-based parcellation, you know, there's lots of ways to do parcellation. You can sort of, you know, do a clustering approach, K-means kind of stuff, yeah. getting more and more complicated. But the boundary-based parcellation approach is exciting because it is conceptually the closest to how areas are best defined in invasive anatomy, right? Yeah. Like, that, you know, going back to the Van Essen stuff, which is so powerful and so inspiring, you march along the cortex yeah. in anatomy, in ana like in a monkey's cortex, right? You march along the cortex and you can measure different properties of different pieces of the cortex. You, you have histological staining, you march along the cortex, you can see different cell types, and you come to a place where things abruptly change. The types of cell types there, going back to Broadman, abruptly change. The, if, you're, if you're mapping sort of electrophysiological response properties, abruptly change. And I think that the boundary-based approach is the closest to matching that very, very biological anatomy oriented theoretical approach where we we believe that there are such things as cortical areas. We think that that is an anatomical fact. We think yep. that they're stable. They don't move around uh, on a moment to moment basis and they can be detected because the at the edge of a cortical areas where response properties change. 
And I think that we did a good job sort of helping people understand that idea and grapple with that idea. And that's why people, I think, were excited about the, the boundary-based approach. And so, um, and we weren't the only ones doing this. I think Matt Glasser's parcellation, it's not the same as ours, but it's, it, and it takes advantage of some of the, like, you know, uh, multimodal registration stuff that the, H, uh, that the HCP did. Um, but that's also a really excellent parcellation because it uses primarily this gradient based, like where do things change boundary mapping approach. And then, and then the stuff that Thomas Yo has been doing recently where he's been, he's been utilizing the boundary based approach in combination with a couple of other metrics and finding that it works really, really well. Um, that also is excellent. I think that all of the best ways to do this have at heart, this question of where in the cortex are, do things abruptly change? Yeah. So do you think also, I mean, and, and there were, you had papers were right. Um, and definitely giving credit to go all the way back to 2008. Um, but you had a paper, uh, I think also Steve Lauman had a, had a paper where, you know, you know, the idea of looking at heterogeneity of the signal within a, within a boundary. And my thought is if you had infinite signal to noise and you lowered your threshold down, uh, how small would these parcels get? I mean, how they, so yeah, we've been doing this in our, in our really nice individuals, um, and they get smaller, they get smaller. And so this is, I, I'm a little embarrassed. Like it, I, you know, ideas change. I don't use our, our group parcellation anymore because it's, I've come to believe that it's not the right scale. We were really excited when we came out with it because we had uh, a 330 odd parcels and it corresponded really well with uh, Van Essen's old estimate of uh, macaque brains having between um, 150 and 200 parcels uh, areas per hemisphere, right? So it's right smack in the middle of there. But individuals have way more discrete parcels than that. And it's kind of made me reorient my thoughts about what these parcels are. There's certain examples you can pick out where you can say, okay, they're clearly not cortical areas. They're clearly subdivisions of cortical areas. The motor strip is the most clear example of that. Yep. You know, the cortical, the motor strip, the, the classic cortical area is, it's, it's a single strip, BA4, right? And it runs all, it's a long strip. And uh, architectonically, it doesn't have subdivisions. But functionally, it has very, very clear subdivisions. And our parcellations can get at those subdivisions and they show those subdivisions. And, you know, that, that's the approach we have. And so we call those parcels representing areas. But of course, we know that they're not architectonic areas. They're, yeah. they're topographic subdivisions of architectonic areas. Hmm. And they're obviously very functionally relevant. We care yeah. about those, those subdivisions. And I thought that, for instance, in the Glasser parcellation, that was the one mistake I thought they made was, was sticking with the anatomy so closely because we know that BA4 is a long strip. And so they sort of intentionally didn't accept the functional subdivisions within BA4. But we do care about those functional subdivisions. But, but if we care about those functional subdivisions, then we have to start thinking about the parcellations that these boundary-based approaches produce. They're not exactly cortical areas. They are subdivisions within cortical areas. Interesting. And which, which once again, uh, you know, do having this densely sampled data, you know, it brings up this question, you know, it's an interesting scientific question. What's the relationship between the cortical areas and the subdivisions? And, you Absolutely, know, is there yeah. something? Yeah, can we, can we, across even sort of complicated parts of cortex, like lateral prefrontal cortex, can we pick out like, oh, look, these four parcels have a property that makes me think that they are uh, topographics or some other, not, not topography, but some other subdivision um, within a certain cortical area. Yeah. I've really been wrestling with this and, and it's a hard question. Yeah. That's, that's really right. I mean, that's actually interesting you know, comparing in detail to the cytoarchitectonics. And so, and, and also I, I actually felt, you know, it, it, it's funny when I read the, and, and I discussed this previously, but when I read the Merrick paper, you know, with the, you know, meeting 2000 subjects to get any sort of significance. I thought, you know, the first thing that came to me is like, well, you know, these parcels, you know, each individual subject, you put it into this template, everything gets smeared out. And to me, that's sort of like the first thing that would, would reduce the power. Absolutely. Uh, there's, uh, there's many other things, but still, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's exactly right. It, you know, it's really a question we sort of have posed this question off and on, and other people are thinking in this way as well. It's, a, it's really a question of how much of the variance. So what we're, what 
what people are using to sort of, you know, do these, these Merrick style BWAS things associating with, with, um, you know, a, a trait level, whatever, are the strength of the functional connectivity, right? But it's a question of when we, when we use a group template and create a, a connectivity matrix, how much, the some amount of variance in there is not due to differences in the strength of connectivity. It's due to differences in the, the individual specific to, topography, the align, the, how well they align with your, uh, your a priori parcels. Um, yeah. One of my favorite papers was uh, Janine Biesterbosch had this paper, I, I want to say in 2018 or so, where she actually parsed these things apart. She, she did the work to parse out like what proportion of the variance in the HCP is due to differences in connectivity strength versus uh, versus different versus spatial variation. And she oh. finds that more than half of the variance is due to the spatial variation. So yeah, most of it. Most of the variance is because people's brains do not line up with each other perfectly well. And also probably because the parcels that we have, the sets of parcels we have, they don't even really reflect, you know, the, the complexity of any individual's brain organization. So I, but, you know, I think, I, I don't think that that's like driving all of the, the problem, the problems that sort of the Merrick paper identified. I think that if we, if we reduce the variance that we're seeing across people by half, because we had sort of perfect alignment uh, with uh, individual specific parcels or something like that, I think we would still be running into these problems where, okay, now it, it doesn't take 3000 people. It takes 1200 people and we would still have a problem for a lot of the work that we would like to do. Right, right. I mean, that's actually what I loved about that paper is it sort of showed us very clearly that, you know, that, right, we maybe have, you know, two heterogeneous populations or, you know, just sort of introduced us to the idea of variance. And, and you actually showed it really, I mean, it was interesting. It brought to mind, like, for instance, you had, and I forgot the paper, but in one of your papers, you actually should, did, uh, you know, I think it was the first one where you did sort of a network analysis across the 10 subjects in the Midnight Scan Club. And you found like two of the subjects didn't have, you know, certain two nodes sort of like connected with each other uh, as much. Um, and, you know, does this mean anything? I mean, so there's a lot of these differences uh, in network connectivity that, or network connectivity strength that that might be arbitrary or maybe not. I mean, maybe they're all related to something that translates the behavior, uh, but it, it really does, uh, force you to ask the question of, okay, what are the differences that are random, you know, or what are the differences that, you know, relate to something important? I mean, and that's a good question to have and you can ask it more with your, with your data. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We've been, we've been thinking about this, this, this specific kind of question a lot. So for example, I think this is a great example. Um, one of the things we showed in the, the neuron paper is the salience network in some people has this very prominent, I always call it this little foot, right? That extends out in the medial prefrontal cortex where you think, okay, most of the time that's default memory, right? Yep. Just from looking at, at that, it's a little hard to tell what's causing it, right? If we believe the area hypothesis, then there's probably an area there that is different somehow, right? It could be that it's different because in some people, this specific area is more connected with the salience network and in other people, it's more connected with the default network because some people have this foot very prominently and some don't. Or it could be that, that in some people, this area is very small and in other people, it's very big. And with the limitations of sort of the spatial smoothing we have, if it's very small, it kind of gets kind of smoothed away and, and it gets smushed together and shows up as more of a pure default thing. And it's not necessarily clear which is which, but I I am fascinated by there is this paper that um, that I'm on that is on the archive, and the the lead author is Chuck Lynch at Cornell. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this paper. This is a great paper. They, this is about a, a precision mapping in depression. What Chuck found is that the salience network, in particular, the the size of the salience network is related to trait susceptibility to depression, hmm. right? But the connectivity within the salience network is related to state uh, susceptibility to depression. So, you know, they track people on a weekly basis and some weeks people are doing much worse than others because, you know, depression is, is a highly fluctuating um, thing. And yeah. they find that on, on days where they scan, like within individual, on days where they scan the, the same individual where he's doing much worse, there is 
uh, is much stronger connectivity between nucleus accumbens, which is part of the salience network, and this like foot area of the salience oh. network, right? So this is this is I'm so excited about this because I've been playing with this idea for a long time. Like like what is the relevant thing? Is it the size? I've always thought the one thing I have thought that is not relevant is the position on the cortical sheet, right? Like if the area sort of moves around a little, that's probably not super important. But if the area is bigger, it might mean something. If the area is differentially connected, it might mean something. And this is the first demonstration of this idea I've had for a long time that they do mean something. They mean different things. Yeah. One is more, the, and this it's exactly what you would predict, that the, the physical location, especially the size, is stable within an individual, but can, is still important across individuals. The connectivity strength is not as stable within individuals and important within, uh, within that individual. It's really cool work. Wow. That's, yeah, that's very cool. That's very cool. And, and right, looking for sort of like, right, finding, you know, there's, there's variables that you have and also the internal connectivity within that node. Um, yeah. And, and sort of, and how would one do that? Because it seems like, I mean, it seems like there's an art to this and we'll get to this with your last finding, but of, of sort of, you know, having these, these questions in your mind, you definitely want to be somewhat hypothesis driven, but you want to make it sort of iterative and sort of kind of let the data sort of speak to you in some sense. And, and if there's certain, there's kind of an art to it, I mean, of, of finding features. I mean, you could certainly do exhaustive searches of everything that you can think of, but it seems that, right. There's, there's probably a better way in terms of, I'm sure with Chuck Lynch, uh, I, I wonder how he came about knowing this or seeing this, or it's like saying, you know, well, Society. certainly, certainly in that case, we started with the idea that the salience network was important because we know it. We knew it had this uh, accumbens connectivity. He has published previous work suggesting that um, that if you want to uh, do TMS for depression, uh, it's specifically the salience node in the lateral prefrontal cortex that is best to target. So he was thinking about the salience network, you know, from the get go. But I, I totally agree. Like, if if you didn't have this a priori hypothesis, if you just went in and said, like, okay, I have. I have everybody's sort of like voxel to voxel connectivity. What is the effect? Like that is a very hard problem. That is a problem, which is it's and, and like, and now if you're getting into not only the connectivity strength, but you also are caring about uh, the size of different areas, maybe the topological arrangement, you're in such a multi-dimensional space. Well, first it becomes very difficult to ask the questions properly. And second, you, you really start worrying about like, okay, I found something did I just find something because I'm in such a huge space that I was always going to find something? And even if I have like large amounts of data, it's just happening by chance in sort of a VWAS way. Yeah. This, is, this is always the problem. I do think that going in with specific hypotheses is critical for this sort of thing. Right, right, <clears throat> exactly. And All right, so I mean, I could spend hours talking about this, but also along the lines of sort of serendipitous sort of uh, uh, findings, I mean, you know, I guess it's been out for almost a year now where, where you're, and you presented this at the Whistler conference. Publication came out in April, I think. Oh, April. Yeah. Oh, but sorry. we put, we put the, we put the preprint up almost exactly a year ago. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah. And that is with the, uh, the motor cortex and you know, you, and it's, it's interesting. You made this discovery uh, of these areas between, you know, the, the, the fine digit areas sort of like that, that, that go between like, you know, the, there's three separate areas, the effector specific regions yeah, um, yeah. in the primary motor cortex that I'm, I'm interested in, in the story of, of kind of how you came about discovering these and, uh, and what they could mean as far as that's concerned. I mean, it was how we came about discovering it was, you know, we, we said, okay, we've been, we've been doing this work recently where we are using our, our precision mapping and we're subdividing brain networks, right? Uh, we've done this in the default network. We are we did this in sort of front or striatal connections. It looks like this is this is mostly working. Let's see if we can find sort of subdivisions in along the motor strip uh, subdivisions of we know we you know we've published before like there's very clearly these hand foot mouth areas in the motor strip. Um, let's see if there's subdivisions in there. If we believe sort of the Penfield homunculus hypothesis, we should see subdivisions, right? Like as we march along in in the foot area, say we should move from like toes to ankle to knee to hip, right? Let's. This is just sort of like a boring thing. Like it's going to be boring. It's going to just tell us exactly what we already know. But you know, we might as well do this, right? 
And so when we just started uh, uh, looking, asking this question, we just started sort of marching along the motor strip. We found that this doesn't look right. This doesn't look like the homunculus. And of course, we didn't believe it. You know, like it, this is not what the textbook said should happen. Um, <laughs> what is happening? Why are we seeing like when we when we're in our hand, foot, face areas, it's very clear. You know, we you see strong homotopic connectivity. That's pr in cortex. That's pretty much all you see. The homotopic connectivity it, it, by the way, is really cool because it's strongest in the face, face to face, right? Second strongest in foot to foot, weakest in hand to hand, which is exactly what you'd expect, right? Yes. That's that's the degree of coordination that absolutely scales with like what we do in everyday life, right? Yes. So like it was very, and then we had, you know, we had the, the HCP motor task. We could overlap these things. It's very clear. Like these are the hand, foot, face areas, super clear. What the heck is happening between these? They have this completely different pattern of connectivity. They, in, they have this within hemisphere connectivity that makes no sense. None of the effector specific regions, none of the hand, foot, face areas have this, but in, but in between the hand, foot, face areas, there's these three areas that are strongly interconnected among themselves within hemisphere and then also very strong very very strongly across hemisphere as strongly as like the face area across hemisphere and then they also have this very strange connectivity to the medial prefrontal regions we call the single opercular network that we know from decades of task fMRI are important for uh, error detection setting goals top level control sort of operations. And these are really strongly connected with primary motor cortex. This is so weird. Of course, we didn't believe this at first. We thought, okay, something is wrong with the data. Something is wrong with the processing. <laughs> something happened weird. But it's exactly what I said before. When you have data this good, yep. you cannot dismiss this kind of thing as noise. Even yes. if it's super weird, even if it doesn't make any sense based on, you know, the first thing you learned in your intro neuroscience class, yeah. you cannot dismiss it as noise. At most, you can say, okay, this person might be really weird, but then you go look at a whole bunch of other people who have a large amount of data and every single person has this, you start believing it. I think that having access to this, the, this precision mapped data was the only thing that let us believe this. Yep. And because, because I think, you know, you, you emailed me that, yep. <laughs> that you had seen this before years ago, and I'm yeah. sure other people have seen this before and just sort of, you know, dismissed it. Like that doesn't make any sense. I, I just, you know, FRI data is noisy. It, it's, well, it it's worse than that. It's worse. I mean, I just, uh, to, to insert there, it's worse than that. I actually, it was in front of my eyes and now, and I'm like, I didn't really see that. And I look back in the data and I'm like, it's there. It's kind of, the, it's kind of there. And, but I didn't even see it. I mean, I actually- Peter, I was... we did the exact same thing in the MSC paper, okay? If you go look at the MSC paper, if you look at the brain maps we made in the MSC paper, we have a whole section about like, like the foot, the hand, and the face area in that paper. But if you look <laughs> at the brain networks, the, there is this little cutout in, in a, at least half the subjects. There's this little cutout in between the hand and face areas that is usually, it's usually connected to singular opercular network right? It was there in the MSC data and we ignored it for the exact reasons that you ignored it. Like you just, you look at it and you don't see it. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's sort of amazing. And, and to me, this has been as much a story about the motor system. To me, it's a story about priors. You know, your yep. priors yeah. so strongly drive what you can see, even when it's right in front of your face, it, it just drives what you can see. And it's it i mean it this has to be true because as we showed in the paper like this system is present in the hcp data it's present in the abcd data it's present in the uk biobank data if you look at the uk biobank you know they they made publicly available like you know like their top whatever however many components right from like a giant pca it's one of the components right <laughs> It shows up as one of the, it's very clearly like the, the introfector system, what we're calling somatic cognitive action network. It's one of the components, right? That's... Nobody looked at it. Nobody believed it because when you don't have the right priors, like you just, you, your eyes, I don't, it's a weird thing. Your eyes just go right over it and you don't notice. Yeah, 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 exactly. And there's really a lesson. I mean, I mean, it's hard to teach that too. It's hard to sort of develop that skill because, you know, there's obviously 
you know, if you if you don't have priors, you'll get a lot of false positives potentially. And yeah. Then, but then you, it's like this weird balance where you get good at looking at the data, and obviously you did something right in terms of recognizing recognizing that, which was just huge. It's yeah. really, it's just, it's just, yeah, it, certainly like there's an expertise in looking at the data, but it's also, like I said, I keep harping on it. It's the quality of the data and yep. you, you, you just can't, you can no longer dismiss things you see, like, which I, you know, I did for my entire career. You see weird stuff. You don't really believe it. It's, you know, fMRI is weird. You can't <laughs> do that anymore. Yeah. And, and so you know, the motor thing is, is, is super exciting. It's super cool. It's not the only thing in the yep. brain that we haven't found yet. Like with, with some of our newer data, we're finding like several interesting new things that nobody's seen before. And I wouldn't have believed it if it wasn't for this really high quality data. That's, that's really exciting. And that's really cool. And actually, I think that's where, you know, that's why I got so excited thinking about this again, looking at this, because this seems like that's where the meat of fMRI is, I mean, obviously there's other applications, but that's, you know, right. If you just collect more data on individual subjects, have it super high quality, there's a lot to be found. I also sense that. And I think that you're doing the right thing as far, I mean, as, far as what you do is just really paving the way as far as that's concerned. So what do you, so just to explain what you think it, uh, uh, these regions in the motor cortex are doing, I mean, it's, it's, what do you think that, what, What's the structure? Yeah, this is this is the hard question. We've obviously been thinking a lot about this, and I'll say that some of this is less supported by data, but I really do believe it, and we're seeing things that that are everything we see sort of points in this direction. I think that the the effector specific systems, the 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 hand and the face and the foot systems, they are um, specialized for isolated movement of the body. Yep. Right. If you need to play the piano, that's the effector specific system. If you need to speak, that's yep. the effector specific system. Um, if you need to honestly do pretty much any of the tasks that we can actually have people motor tests that we can have people do in the fMRI scanner, it's the effector specific system. The the inter effector system is totally it's very isolated from the effector specific system. Yep. Like in some subjects, the inter effectors are negatively connected, negative connectivity with the hand area, for instance, highly independent from the effector specific system, right? It's, they're also much more tied in to these action, like goal setting, action planning regions. They, they're more strongly connected to a lot of subcortical regions. And then, you know, there's this, there's this monkey data that really suggests that they converge the monkey homologs of the effector specific system converge with regions that like Peter Strick has seen are projecting down to internal organs, right? Yeah. So, so you put all of this together. Our best idea for this is that the inter effector system is actually evolutionarily older, right? It is a system for integrated whole body movement. And there's actually really cool and increasingly more stuff coming out uh, soon. Uh, really cool neuros, uh, neurosurgical work coming out showing that support, basically supporting our findings completely that in between the hand, foot, and mouth areas, there are regions, motor regions that are not specialized for a certain sort of movement, that, res that are responsive for any type of motor movement. And so if th this system, it's, it's for integrated movements, it's plugged into like, I want something, I need something, I'm going to go do something sort of regions of the brain. We believe like this is the system that maybe rats have a lot more of. Go back even older, lampreys, right? If you, if you were designing a, a, an organism that doesn't have these fine control effectors that just needs to go places and do things and all of its movements are whole body movements. Yeah. This is the system that that uses, right? The the cool, complicated stuff that we've developed as primates because we need to do tool use, because we need to to speak, that is maybe evolutionarily newer, right? And so yeah. I my idea is that the effector, that the inter-effector regions used to be the whole motor strip, yeah. and then the effector-specific regions sort of started inserting themselves into the motor strip and sort of, you know, expanding and pushing the inter-effector regions, the, the integrated regions into these sort of smaller and smaller pieces because we need more and more of this uh, of this independent control of specific effectors for things like, oh, I have to type all the time. I need to yeah. write. 
uh, I need to I need to figure out how to use this wrench. The the evolutionarily older part is the intraeffector system, and it's it's the part that's strongly tied, much more strongly tied into our intentions. And we we really think that this is the system, you know, that that's that when you have physical symptoms of anxiety about upcoming plans, this is what's happening. You know, I'm I'm nervous about about talking to you because you're awesome. And so like an hour before, like my palms start sweating and I get like a little jittery. Do I get yeah. jittery like this where my only my fingers are moving? I don't. I get sort of whole body jittery, right? That's the anxiety about not things that ha are happening right now, upcoming plans that are working its way into my motor system and causing whole body movements and then projecting down into, into uh, my endocrine system to make me have all of these physical symptoms. Yeah. That is, that's, that's such a, yeah, that's a, that's a, I, I, I agree with it off the, off the top of my head. I mean, it seems like it's a, it's a beautiful construct. You can imagine, right. Evolutionarily as the frontal lobe also is expanding, there's these areas that are expanding out along the motor cortex to accommodate for that. And yeah, that's, and, and right. Like you said, it's initially whole body that's related to sort of just, you know, whole body, like responding to things or getting ready for things or, and then, right. The detailed movements that you know, require, maybe require, you know, also sort of are linked in some way to, you know, expanding cortex, other areas to do more detailed work. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. That's it. That's, that's a great, I, that's a great construct. Uh, yeah. Now, I mean, we have to figure out how best to test it. Um, <laughs> a lot of the ways that we're thinking about testing it have to do with sort of, we're, we're thinking about like a lot of clinical work. Yeah. Um, we're, we're thinking about, we're looking into testing it in a variety of different um, <clears throat> like movement disorder stuff. We're thinking about, we, we're looking at like uh, uh, epilepsy. We think that there's something happening in epilepsy, especially because these regions are so strongly connected to the central medial nucleus mm -hmm. of the thalamus, which is of course like what you have to target with DBS when you have, when you have generalized epilepsy. Uh, we're thinking even about things like chronic pain. Chronic pain is so interesting. Do you know that, there, that the stimulation treatment for chronic pain is do you know what it is no it's no the the only thing that works is direct stimulation of motor cortex huh. oh, so yeah. if you have if you have chronic central pain right like it's not in your body it's it's a problem in your brain usually caused by a stroke in uh central median uh, or at least in medial thalamus right you have chronic pain the only thing that works is direct cortical stimulation of motor cortex and nobody knows why right and, you know, the, the people are saying like, oh, it's because motor cortex has reciprocal connections to like sensory cortex and sensory cortex is actually the important thing. But if you sense, stimulate sensory cortex, it doesn't work. Huh. You have okay. to stimulate motor cortex. Interesting. And we think that this is, this is, there's probably, we believe that like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense that you would stimulate your face area or your hand area and it would help your chronic pain. But maybe if there's this whole body integrated system that's, that's doing something. Yeah. That's where yeah. you need to stimulate. And we actually, there is some preliminary data we have that's pointing in this direction. Interesting. That's really cool. So you think that somehow that disrupts that sort of uh, circuit in some sense that, or, or does something to, right, alleviate that, yeah, from your peripheral system, from your whatever. Um, yeah, because, because the single opercular network, in addition to doing all the cognitive things that I've said, also is the part of the brain that cares most about pain. Okay. And with its strong connectivity to the intereffectors, there's something happening there where stimulation of the intereffectors allows some sort of feedback into that system. It's we, I, I'm not sure exactly what's happening, but it it looks real to, uh, from our eyes. Yeah, and that's interesting. I mean, it's it. I wonder if it would be sort of an inhibitory input that the intereffectors use. I mean, have or or excitatory. I mean, if you stimulate it, you don't know what they're projecting out. Yeah. In that so that's really that's very cool. That's yeah, I mean, there's perfect example of of you know what could come of this is sort of like you know you have this iterative you know you get some understanding you realize there's a you know anecdotal evidence of clinical treatments and and you start building something that's completely different. And, completely and this different. is and this is where precision mapping naturally has this huge advantage for doing translation to clinical because because we can just take patients you know and we can do precision mapping in patients and we can tell neurosurgeons, oh, this is the exact spot that, that we would hypothesize you want to stimulate. Yeah. Yeah. 
And that's actually leads us to the next part, right? As far as um, the, the, the last part, as far as what, how to go forward in the future, as far as with fMRI, I mean, there's, there's I mean, certainly there's a search for biomarkers, you know, using uh, uh, you know, population studies, but there's also, right. I mean, and not, you know, there's a growing number of groups, but they're, you know, similar to yours that, you know, are really doing deep scanning on individuals and finding more information that's somehow that translates more readily to clinical practice in, in this regard. And um, that you, that would be totally lost if you did, if you tried to do some sort of grouping of populations and comparing in that regard. So yeah. what do you and think? I, yeah. I mean, so in my opinion, like this is obviously I'm, I'm biased because this is, you know, the sort of work I do, but you know, in my opinion, this is the best possible use of fMRI, right? Because so it's actually where this, this translation to clinical, like the, the potential is coming around at, at a great time because because of the rise of, of brain stimulation therapies, right? We've had TMS, which has been around for a while, but you know, the response are people doing it the best possible way. We have DBS, which is really a, which demonstrated really effective for certain types of, of uh, conditions. And then we also have things like uh, focused ultrasound, which is an alternative to DBS, but like a terrifying one, because like, if you miss, then you're kind of in trouble. And then, I'm really excited about the future. I don't know how soon this, this is probably 10 years off, but, but LIFU, low intensity focused ultrasound, um, as far as I can tell, looks like it's going to be TMS, but easier to target, more focal and can get into deep structures potentially. Hmm. Okay. Um, so yep. I, think, I think all of these are going to be developed clinically. And in my opinion, all of them would most critically benefit from accurate maps. Yep. And what is fMRI good at? It, it's fMRI is, I would say it's not actually that good at diagnosing, you know, like diagnosing ADHD. Like it no. you can try to use it for that, but I don't know that diagnosing ADHD is the ideal thing to do with this technology when I don't know if it's, I don't know how well it, it's not clear that it actually beats out a clinical diagnosis, right? Yeah. But yes. what is fMRI really good at? mapping the brain, telling somebody this is the exact place in the brain that is important. That is the, that is the core strength of fMRI and using the core strength of fMRI to help clinical treatments that desperately need localization to work best. Like to me, that's, that's a no brainer. And I don't under, frankly, I don't understand why this is not like a huge thrust in the fMRI community. Yeah. I completely agree, and it just brings to mind also, like for instance, Michael Fox's work and yeah. you know, using uh, you know neuromodulation in, in, in that regard too. And obviously, he's also from WashU, so there must have been some, there. There's something in the water. There's, there's something. There's some strong cultural uh, uh, an idea uh, that's floating there that's really good, I think. Um, and I think you're. I totally agree as well with what you're saying. Um, yeah, I mean, there's certainly uses in some ways. It is interesting for what it's worth, but, you know, we have so much potential, you know, we can just scan individual subjects more and we'll keep on learning more about them and more about how they vary. And and that is the interesting question. I mean, you you can't do, you know, whole population studies and, and it is tricky to sort of, uh, sort of compare individual phenotypes with their brain maps in some way. But like you said, they can, you can, you know, really look at these, you know, in detail, what these structures do and, and, and how they do vary. And in all of neuroscience, it's sort of done this way too. I mean, sort of like you have, you know, five monkeys to work with and you're really yeah. probing deeply. Exactly. Um, and, and the other thing is I think people are scared of this approach uh, because there's this, there's this idea out there of, I want to study this clinical population. They can't, they can't do, they can't do that much scanning. I'm sorry. They just can't. Yeah. And I strongly disagree with that based on personal experience. Every time I talk to people, there's like, well, you know, how much data can we actually get in kids? How much data can we actually get in, you know, this population? The answer I think is more than you think. We're, we're currently running studies in uh, a, a, a adolescents and pre-adolescents. We're running studies in, you know, I'm collaborating with folks who are running studies in infants and neonates. We're doing studies, uh, all this precision mapping, high data collection. Uh, I'm doing studies in uh, movement disorders and in traumatic brain injury. 
Um, I had collaborating with folks who are, are scanning uh, epileptics. There are clinical populations that I think can't easily be scanned. Folks who are uh, cognitive disa uh, uh, cognitively disabled can't really understand, like they're in the scanner, they need to remain still. Those are always going to be tough, but right. there's so many more populations than everybody thinks that can be scanned repeatedly that I think it's it's worth at least trying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And it, and it does take a little bit of a restructuring of how you do things and you have to, you know, it's a little bit of uh, motivating of the volunteer to keep on coming back. But, yeah. um, you know, it's there's, it's really valuable data. <laughs> um, yeah. So, OK, I mean, I, I think on, on that note, would there, so is there any um, just looking in the future, is there any advice uh, that you would give, you know, either a new or, a, or an old fMRI researcher in terms of uh, uh, what I mean, obviously, it's pretty clear what advice uh, comes through from our from our speaking. But any specific advice, and you know, what fMRI might turn out to be in the next five years or so, and and how to how to do their research as far as that's concerned. I think I think the number one sort of message that I like to give people is we're not done mapping the brain. I think that I think that Yo 2011 came out and told us what the major functional networks in the brain were. And everybody's like, okay, great. We're, we're done. That's the Atlas. We're going to use that, those, those regions to sort of investigate things, but yeah. we're not finished. There's a lot of work still to do it, it. To me, it's like the analogy that I like to use is it's like, it's like we are in the 1600s and we have finally circumnavigated the globe and we have this idea of where the outlines of all the continents were, right? <laughs> right. And so geography is over. We don't <laughs> need to do any sort of more mapping. We're done exploring. Yeah. And it's just not true. There's, yeah. there's so much detail that we've missed. We have to fill in all the lakes and rivers. We have to do careful work to understand the details of brain organization. Sometimes there's even like an Australia that nobody noticed that's just sort of hanging out. And like, there, there's going to be something like that in the brain. We're like, yeah. oh my gosh, I never realized this thing was here. I, I think people, I, I want people to get excited about the new things that are still there to be found in the brain, because I think it's a lot. Well, thanks again. Thanks again for, for taking the time to, to talk. And, and hopefully those listening will look into some of the literature that, that we talked about and, and, and maybe consider doing more deep imaging. So yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. I love being on. This was great. All right. Neurosalience is brought to you by Organization for Human Brain Mapping. This episode is produced by Omar Farouk Gülban and Alfie Wang.